If you are new to Unison, if it's your first time here, what's up? My name is Chase. I'm, it's a joy to worship with you this morning. Um, we are week two in our Red Letters series where we are examining uh, the words of Christ, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount. And so last week we started, and even though we didn't actually get into any of the text of the Sermon on the Mount last week, it was really kind of setting the stage for Christ's words being authoritative. Um, and so if that's not something that you are here for, I encourage you to listen to that. You can get that on the podcast. Um, you can go to the website. It's there too. Um, but ultimately, I also gave... Uh, us the homework assignment of reading or listening to Matthew chapter 5 and 7. I'm not going to ask who did it. Yes. But no, I said I'm not going to ask. <laughs> like, <laughs> it would be a teacher that would be like, I did. <laughs> um, the beautiful thing is you still have it at your fingertips. If you didn't get a chance, I'd love for you throughout this series to let that be something that you are meditating on, right? Like there's something about Sunday. Yes, come. There's a sermon. It's good. Let it be a part of transforming your life. Yes to that. And I also would love for you to allow the Word of God to be transforming you in the middle of the week, too. Be in that mug on Wednesday. <laughs> be in there listening or reading. Um, you don't have to read both chapters in one setting, but just throughout this series, be meditating on Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And so we're starting it with a familiar portion. We're starting like Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus started his Sermon on the Mount, um, uh, which is chapter 5, and we're starting at verse 3. The title of this sermon is God Bless This Mess, uh, which some of you, y'all have that sign in your house somewhere. It's in your kitchen, probably, or maybe your laundry room, <laughs> right? Like, or you have seen it somewhere. Yes, that sign, right? Hanging up somewhere. Some of you was like, listen, I got that right when you come in the door because <laughs> I want people to be fully aware of what this is, okay? We make memories here, <laughs> like that, right? <laughs> Which is low-key, I ain't gonna be cleaning up all day. We make memories here. No? <laughs> so God bless this mess is the title of the sermon, and it is in what, uh, the sermon comes out of what we often call the Beatitudes, um, and we'll be going through those, but if you ever hear that that title, that term, the Beatitudes. It's the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and that's what we're talking about. We'll be in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12, and um, I'm going to pray, and then we'll hop into it. Father, we honor you. We glorify you, God. Woo. Holy Spirit, you not, are, not only are here, but you've laid groundwork for us on this day. Uh, and you've been like moving and sometimes would feel like, like doing somersaults through the aisles, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are with us. Uh, you are for us as well. We thank you for your scripture. We thank you for this word, which is authoritative, shapes who we are, guides us, but also comforts us, heals us and restores us, and gives us a clear picture of your values, your character, and your culture. May we adopt those as our own, and may this be a part of that. And may every single thing I say be glory to your name and build up this body. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so before we start getting into the blesseds, because if you are familiar with this portion of scripture is a lot of blessed is the this and blessed be the this and blessed be the that. And all of those things are great. I think it's important, though, that we have at least a shared definition or understanding of what it means to bless something, because that's not that doesn't always come to us. Sometimes we think of bless as just to give me something good. Right. Because that's kind of how we use it sometimes. Ooh, somebody blessed me with this or the Lord blessed me with that. And that's not 
an incorrect use of that word. Keep using it that way. Like, and some of us, the only time we really use bless is when we're in Meyer and you at that, we have that one cashier who always like, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed. <laughs> right? I have one of those. My, the 28th Street Meyer, every single time I ask her how she's doing, I'm blessed. Yes, you are, ma'am. Yes, you are. Right? <laughs> and, but in terms of how bless shows up in this portion of Scripture, and throughout many portions of Scripture, it means to speak well of, right? So when Jesus was brought to the temple and there was the prophet and, you know, pro- prophetess Anna and Simeon were there and they blessed him, they spoke well of him. When the fathers in Genesis, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when they brought their children to them and they would speak over them, they were to speak well of them. And ultimately, any time, like that's kind of like a foundational definition of what it means to bless something, is I, have, I want to speak well of you. I want to speak favor and full life over you, right? It's like the quintessential opposite of curse. And I don't mean just like cuss, right? I mean to actually the opposite, to speak negative, to speak like pain and to speak harm over, to bless is to do the positive opposite, to speak favor and full life, to speak joy and peace over So every time that we see this word bless in here, this is what it's getting at. This is what Jesus is getting at when he's talking about this. It's not just that they are happy or they have all the things. Jesus is speaking well of favor and full life over and joy and peace over these people. Now we can jump into it. Matthew chapter 5 Verse 3 says this, God blesses those who are poor, I'll get to that asterisk in a moment, and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Some of your versions of scripture says something like, blessed are the poor in spirit. And I put an asterisk there because there's a little bit of difference in this version. This is the New Living Translation. And that difference, it actually, like, like, The original Greek, it actually is poor in spirit. That's exactly what it means. But I actually don't want us to like pretend that poor in spirit for them was more than just I need a savior. Poor in spirit was manifested as in poor in your pocketbook too, right? Poor in how you are engaged in the world. It was a part of how they believed that God functioned with humanity and to some degree, honestly, how we kind of talk about it too, that if you're poor in the the economic world, that means you're poor somewhere else too. That's kind of how we talk about it. I'm sorry if I stepped on your toes and made you a little uncomfortable. But we tend to just automatically believe that individuals who are living in poverty have some sort of deficit in their life. They're missing something or they don't want it or they have some problem that is beyond what the regular folks are navigating that causes them to not be able to experience economic success. And ultimately, Jesus is getting at that. Why am I saying that? I'm going to come back to this verse, but I want us to actually go to James chapter 2 because James also speaks like this. Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters, hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom who he promised to those who love him? This is not talking about people who just know they need a savior. This is also talking about people who are struggling to make ends meet. And it's that idea of being rich in faith that both Jesus is pointing to and James. Can you go back to that other one for me? Because Jesus says, and realize their need for him. It's not just blessed are those who are poor. 
skip over that for their, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs? No. It's the combination, that word conjunction and, you know, go back to your schoolhouse rock days. <laughs> conjunction, junction, what's your function? It's a both. Blessed are those who are poor and realize their need for him. They actually will inherit the kingdom of God. I actually believe when uh, there was a moment when Jesus was talking to the disciples and, uh, uh, and some of you will remember this. There was, Mary came, she busted open a jar of perfume and kind of started cleaning Jesus' feet with it and then was rubbing her hair all over it. And Judas says like, hey, what are you doing? That's a whole year's wages worth of perfume. You could have sold that or you could have used that money and, we, and gave it to the poor. And Jesus is like, you'll always have the poor with you, which is like, ooh, that hurts my soul. Because you would think Jesus would be like, follow me and you'll never be poor again. But that's not actually it. Because I actually do believe that those of us who have lived in financial and economic struggle and who are living in economic struggle have something that we offer the world that those who do it on their own don't have. And it is a true, sincere faith and dependence upon God that teaches the world that we actually need God. When I'm struggling financially, but ain't nobody in this house losing weight, you know God is in that mug. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. When you're struggling financially and you are on your knees asking God, look, there have been times where I, I remember this, driving down the street asking God, Lord, will you please breathe into my tank? You have the breath of life. <laughs> I remember distinctly early in marriage, it was just Christine, CJ, and I, and I was coming home for work, and I had gotten paid that day. It was direct deposited, and there was zero dollars, probably negative dollars, in the account. And I was like, the money is there. If I can just get from work to the closest BP. I will be fine. And I started the car like, God, turn the radio off. Just nothing. Just you and me, Jesus. Just. And I was like, God, I'm on 28th Street, God. Just, there's a whole bunch of gas stations, Lord. I believe you. I know you can do it. And there was a moment where I was like, Lord, just breathe into the tank. And literally, I started running out of gas about 100 yards from the BP and coasted into the, <laughs> coasted right into the thing. I'm like, thank you, God, you did it. You don't actually have that if you have a bunch of money in your account. You never see God breathe into your account, into your tank. You don't have a reason to ask him. Your heart doesn't race while you're driving down the street trusting in God. And I'm not saying that those of us who are financially stable and wealthy don't have faith, but I'm telling you that Jesus blesses those who their heart rate is going because they didn't have gas this morning and they needed him to breathe into their tank. <laughs> when, they, when we realize our need for him, then we become inheritors of this kingdom. He goes on, Matthew chapter 5, verse 4 says, God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I've talked about this before, but many of us, we don't, in, we don't encourage each other to grieve fully. We don't actually talk about mourning the way we should. We want the comfort part, and actually, sometimes we socially pressure each other not to grieve or mourn. Don't cry. We're sitting at a funeral. Don't cry. Be strong. But God doesn't bless the people who suck their tears back up in their eyes. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Some of us are busy comforting ourselves. 
not actually allowing the spirit to do what is one of the spirit's first jobs. Right. Jesus said, I'm sending you a comforter. Yes, and we're busy comforting ourselves with video games, busy comforting ourselves with alcohol, comforting ourselves with other people, comforting ourselves with social media, comforting ourselves with you got your thing, yep. but I'm saying that Matthew mm -hmm. says to us that we get to mourn yeah. and grieve loss and anticipate a comforter in that blessed, blessed God speaks well of, speaks favor and full life over, yeah. speaks joy and peace over people who mourn. Yeah. Yeah. If you see why it says bless this mess yet, you caught it? Mm. Nothing about this is like, what? That, that doesn't feel very blessed. Let's keep going. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. Ooh. I'm going to be completely honest, and I don't even know what that last part means, really. I can't even imagine what that is. But I can see how that looks very countercultural, because I feel like the arrogant own the earth. Have you felt that? There are people who arrogantly think they know all things, arrogantly believe that they have something to offer the world that is new and special and powerful, put themselves not perhaps at the right hand of the Father, but at the left hand. <laughs> I'm a, it's just God, Jesus, and me. We got this, y'all. I'm a part of the Trinity now arrogantly. Some of us are seeing some arrogant commercials. And I'm looking forward to November 6th. <laughs> Deliver us from the commercials, King Jesus. <laughs> some of us are seeing and hearing some arrogant things on social media and it feels like you might have to put that on in order to actually have a piece of stake and ownership in the world that we live in. But God blesses the humble because what they own now you will inherit. That part. What it feels like the arrogant own now the humble will inherit. Verse 6, God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice. Yours might say righteousness. For they will be satisfied. I appreciate that it gives the qualifier, not just those who are hungry, not just those who hunger and thirst for whatever it is that they want, but specifically hunger and thirst for righteousness or this godly view of justice. And I actually want to be, take a moment and take a beat. This isn't Chase's version of justice or Chase's version of righteousness that we're talking about, because I got a whole bunch of justices that I'm hungering for, that God is not actually looking to enact upon the world. But as I align my definition and my desire for justice with God's righteousness, right. then right. I'm filled. Mm -hmm. I'm satisfied. I'm pausing primarily because that word satisfied, some of us, that isn't true for, not yet. I want justice in the way that I see it, and then I'll be satisfied. 
as real human beings, we get to actually say that out loud. There have been moments where I've actually said that to God. That's not the justice I want. Some paraphrase, I'm paraphrasing some version of that. I've said, that's not what I want that to look like, God. And the moment that I deny myself the ability to say that, I also deny myself the ability to submit to. I actually get to say it. God, that's not the justice I want. Why am I saying it that way? David says it enough time in Psalms where God, he is disagreeing with God's justice, disagreeing with God's will, and then he submits. So there's some justice that some of us want to enact. There's some things that I've seen on the news this week that I'm like, bury them under the jail. <laughs> that's my version of justice. Bury them. Don't just put them in jail. Dig a hole and throw them in there and seal it. <laughs> That's what I want to see happen. Okay, Lord, what you, all right, let me just then sur sur surrender and submit to whatever it is, the justice that you see. There's disparities in this world, God. I legit want every single person who's walking with you to never experience economic disparity. And that's not the justice that you see. And I disagree with it, but I submit. I surrender and I seek justice in the way that you do. Seeking justice in the way that you do looks like humanizing individuals whom the world has dehumanized because of their economic status. The world sees them as less than human. So Chase, what are you going to do to make sure that that's not true when they're in your presence? That's the justice that God actually sees as righteous. And in that space, I'm satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful. Sorry for wanting to put them under the jail. <laughs> for they will be shown mercy. I'm just saying, like... The more you go through this, the more you just see that I'm not quite there yet. I'm just not. I, listen. I'm not. I have mercy for quite a few things. And there's some stuff I saw on the news this week that I, I have the Lord is still working on me. The Lord is still working on me. And so I need the reminder that God blesses those who are merciful. Not neglectful. Not careless. Not reckless. Not prone to ignoring. Those aren't mercy. That's negligent. Mercy. For they will be shown mercy. Blessed, sorry, I like I went King James with you. God blesses. <laughs> Listen to, to the next one. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. Verse nine. God blesses those who work for peace. For they will be called the children of God. Man. Working for peace. I actually appreciated the, the wording of that. Because sometimes I don't actually have control over whether or not peace actually shows up. Mm -hmm. Some of you work in an office where you are working for peace. And it is not showing up. <laughs> Some of you have a home where you're working for peace, but it's not showing up. Some of you are, have a family that when you get together on holidays or for funerals or for weddings, you're working for peace. You're fasting the day before. <laughs> but when you get there, it's not showing up. I appreciated the wording here because you too are blessed. 
God speaks well of you. The, the part that I love is it's not God blesses those who enact peace or who make peace or who manipulate the environment to sh have some form of shallow peace. God blesses those who are working for peace. Mm -hmm. For they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right. Some of yours said for righteousness sake. Mm. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Which is interesting because those who are persecuted and those who are poor have the same inheritance, which is a very interesting thought. The poor and those who are persecuted for doing right. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. He wraps up with these last couple of moments, just with these Beatitudes. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you, period. No. <laughs> Some of you are like, yes, yes, that's why. Get off my social media page. Like, no, because you are my followers. I think this is the th area where we kind of like, we get mixed up. I'd say that we tend to feel like God is going to bless me because someone has said something bad about me, or that's what we hope to have happen. Like, <laughs> and that's actually not what I'm saying. Like, no, God's not going to bless you because you got into an argument with somebody about some policy, <laughs> and they told you you didn't know what you were talking about. That ain't got nothing to do with your followership of Christ. Jesus is speaking to some people who are under the, like the, the thumb is what I like to call it. They're under the thumb of Roman tyranny. They are, they are, not, are not just feeling oppressed. Some of us have been caught by the wave of like rhetoric that makes us as believers in the United States feel oppressed. Well, we ain't oppressed. Not like these individuals. The idea of at this, I mean, at, at this point in the story, being associated with Jesus at this point means you might get jumped. <laughs> Maybe not killed quite yet. We're not, we're not close enough to the crucifixion, but they might get some rocks thrown at them. You could at any moment, I'm not even saying that not everybody in the room, this is our vibe, but at any moment, you could leave this building, drive to the nearest public place, stand in the middle of it, say Jesus, and walk out, and no one will say anything to you. They might join you. Yes, what are we singing, fam? <laughs> Oceans? Like, <laughs> what are we singing? They might join you. We're not persecuted. These individuals, they walk out into the public square and say, Jesus is the son of God. People start picking up boulders. They start picking up rocks like, nah, I don't even need you to explain it. It's heresy. I'm throwing stuff at you. That's the kind of thing that Jesus is talking about. That, and that's, that is, that's just the theological tension. They also have economic and political tension. Being, in, being under Roman, the Roman Empire, they can't even fully practice what it is to follow God, even if they didn't want to follow Jesus. It's still a struggle. There is absolutely, let's just be real, there's no way for us to fully understand what this is. Not fully. That doesn't take us, that doesn't mean that we should say, ignore it. There are actually brothers and sisters that you have in Christ who are experiencing that right now. Maybe you should echo the words of Jesus. Let's bless them. 
We spend far too long praying about how we can't see Jesus in our politics, but there are people who can't say Jesus in their own living rooms. That's the kind of persecution that Jesus is talking about that we should be speaking blessing over. Speak well of our sisters and brothers who are living in that day to day, moment by moment. Speak full life and favor over those individuals for whom if they let on to their family that they have accepted Christ, not only will they be disowned, but they might actually be killed by their own parents. Speak full life over them the way that Jesus is right here. Speak joy and peace over those who can't sing worship songs as loudly as we do, who sign them in basements in China. Mm. Speak just like Jesus does. He says that God blesses them. And And more than that, He says to them, be happy about it, (laughs) which, okay, Jesus, I don't know how. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Mm -hmm. That's the part that is the tension that Jesus is speaking with throughout this whole portion is, I mean, it is intense. Our sisters and brothers who can't say Jesus as loudly as we do, who are truly being persecuted for their faith, join in the ranks of Elijah and Jeremiah and Obadiah. That's their peer group. And the world may not know their names like we know Elijah and Elisha and Jeremiah and Obadiah and all the other ones. But their reward is of a similar value. I'm going to say that. It's a great reward awaits them in heaven. So here's one of the things that I, I want us to see in this. This is, this is a couple of things. God is blessing people who are carrying all these different unique kinds of burdens. Not every one of those actually applies to you. I think that's one of the joys of being in a multi-everything kind of congregation is that if we're in a group of individuals who have the same kind of cultural oppression or the same kind of socioeconomic status or the same type of whatever, we can lean into one and say, that's who we are and God's blessing us. And the truth is, you walked in here carrying, and you have been carrying most of your life, one of these kinds of burdens, perhaps. You work in a place where you can play your 91.3 all the way up to the door. And the moment you get into the office, the looks Not only just the looks, but no one sits with you at lunch because of your faith. Or not just that they don't sit with you, you keep getting overlooked for promotions because the people who you work with, like they may or may not say to you out loud, if you want a promotion, just trust your God for it. That's a kind of persecution. Uh, We don't get to have, we don't have all, not everybody has that. Some of us in this room, 
We live that first blessing. Those of us who are poor and need and know our need for God, you live it. Some of us are mourning. You're in it. I want you to have this. I want you to have this reminder to carry your burden, but also receive the blessing. Oftentimes, we want to have it be one or the other. Just bless me and take it away, God. And that's actually not this equation. (laughs) This equation is as you live that in a way that points directly to the Father, there is a blessing that comes in that. It is a full life. It is joy. It is peace. It is favor. And here's where it gets messy. That doesn't always feel good. It just doesn't. We talked about this before. A relationship with God doesn't take away your problems. It doesn't. It, that is not how this works. And in many cases, it might give you a couple of more problems. <laughs> like, you're like, you might end up like, with a few more issues. The, the point isn't that I start this relationship with Christ and every single dream I've ever had comes true. There is a uniqueness, though, in that I'm going to have problems in this world either way. I also have access to full life and joy and peace. I have access to favor and connectedness to a creator who intimately wants good for me. And will make sure that even if I don't have a six-figure salary, nobody in this house is going hungry. That even when I am grieving, I still have jokes somehow. That even when people are persecuting me, I still feel the Spirit of God move through me mightily while I sign in basements or sit alone at lunchroom tables. Real talk, students. I know what it is to be a teenager who actually loves God and wants to live that way in high school. It is not easy. (laughs) Not easy at all. Not just because it was the, quote, right thing to do. I feel God moving in me when I think about it as a teenager. It's not just because it's the right thing. Trust me when I tell you it's not easy to do. And also that God will give you both strength and peace to do it well. I tr- like, that's like, I feel like being super old. I'm a living witness. <laughs> I will tell you, I can say with confidence that as you live your teenage life for God, as challenging as that might be, when it, and as overwhelming as it may seem, to have all of your peers moving in a completely different direction, and how alone that might feel, trust me when I tell you that your life is full and it has peace, and that doesn't always feel that way on Monday morning. Things change dramatically as you age and grow closer with God. And honestly, there's a closeness and a fullness of life that is truly uncompared to anything that we're going to figure out on our own and receive that blessing. There's another little thing that's a little bit more practical than that. Everything that Jesus is talking about are the principles of the culture of the kingdom of God. (laughs) Right? Like, some of you have heard sermons about this before, and it's like, it's this upside-down kingdom. And ultimately, they're comparing 
what Jesus is saying to the world that we live in is like, mm, those feel like opposites. And that's because in many ways they are opposites. They were opposites then and they're opposites now. But these are the principles of the culture of God's kingdom. And it's not just being rebellious to the culture. It's actively looking. If you truly pay attention to what is actually happening with all of these blessings, it is the world has dehumanized everybody in these categories, and God restores their humanity. The world has made them less than. And God makes them beyond what they can imagine. That's how the culture of the kingdom of God works. That's legitimately what Jesus has done, what Jesus was doing. Why he's inviting, why he's hanging out with tax collectors and prostitutes and disreputable sinners is because the rest of the world shuns them and says, you all aren't completely human. And Jesus says, I actually want to hang out with y'all. I like you better than the other ones. And all the while, listen, and all the while, those who catch that pattern, we are echoing Jesus' disposition to restore their humanity. And all along the way, I am actually being more, made more human. That's actually the blessing for both in those. What does that mean? What does that mean? As I try to avoid all these individuals and as I continue in the pattern of dehumanizing them, I actually look more and more dehumanized myself. I look less like Christ. I look less like what God designed humans to be. And the more and more I shun them, the more I actually look like I'm not the way that the creator has designed. But as I put myself close to them, just like Jesus said, when you do this for these, my sisters and brothers, right? People who are incarcerated, people who are poor, people who don't have clothes, people who don't have food. When you hang out with them and you restore their humanity the way that I did, your humanity is actually restored. Your humanity is actually codified there. But the more that you try to run away from these experiences, the more that you try to shun these individuals, you look nothing like me. And the world did not, doesn't need you to actually look pretty. The world needs you to look like me. That's what I created you for. Look like me to rocks and birds and beetles. Look like me to other human beings. And when you look like me, you look like humans are supposed to look. And the more you keep ignoring, you're pretending that you're looking good, but you look filthy. This is, so I'm one of those preachers that I drop hints along the way. I'm just letting you know now, I'm a hint dropper because I like things like storytelling and irony. All along, I've been dancing around this idea. Part of it is just because of the political season that we're in. But I have said here before and will continue to say, we have to question this idea that we're a Christian nation. Question it. Can you go to that next slide for me? Do you live in a Christian nation? Compare these principles to those of your nation. Do you live in a place that blesses the poor? And I'm not saying that gives them food stamps. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying blesses them, speaks well of. Are you, do you live in a nation that well, on, so where, where everybody here speaks well of those who actually receive government assistance, trust me, I've been in that space. I've filled out them forms on the Bridge website. I've, and I've felt the frustration of having every single question try to actually weed me out of receiving what's there. Is that a nation that blesses the poor?
Or do I routinely see commercials that actually curse the poor? That says that the poor are lazy. That says that they don't want to work. That says that they're probably using government assistance to buy new phones. That's not a country. I'm just, listen, I'm just saying. That's not blessing. Do we bless those who mourn or do we tell them to stop crying in funerals? Do we bless those who come to us with sadness? Or do we tell them that it's going to be okay and just say, it must have happened for a reason. God's doing something. That's not a blessing. That's a curse. To bless someone who is mourning is to say, I have no solution for the pain that you're in. But sister, brother, I'll sit with you as long as you need. Do I need to cancel a meeting so I can be with you? I'll do it. I'll cry with you. I'll cry for you. Do we bless those who are mourning culturally? Or do we start finding ways to diminish their grief? Do we bless those who are merciful? Or do we bless those who enact very strange forms of justice? Do we bless those who are humble? Or do we bless those who are arrogant? Do we bless those who hunger for righteousness? Or just hungry for filling their own forms of happiness? We got a whole part of our constitution that says pursue your own happiness. That's who we bless here. <laughs> do we bless peace workers? And do we bless those for having godly integrity? That's probably something that we should consider before, that, before we echo the idea that we live in a Christian nation, because if these are the principles of the kingdom of God, and we don't see these in the place where we live, it doesn't mean where we live is bad. I'm not saying that. I like living here. I'm just saying, before we echo an untruth about where we live being a Christian nation, compare them to what Jesus is saying. Compare it. Chase, I have no control over the culture of this, this nation. You're right. <laughs> we don't. We have a part in it. We get to play a part in it. But the truth is, the reason why what Jesus was saying was opposite then and opposite now is because that's kind of it's supposed to look opposite to every nation in this, on this planet. Kind of is. We're supposed to stick out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're supposed to be odd birds. It's a part of our charm. It's what makes us, it makes, what's what makes people curious about us. But you do have control over some places. You can make these principles the culture of your home. That's single, married, with children, without. Everyone who walks in your home can actually live under the blessing that this is by me saying, I may not be the president or the queen or the king or anything of this place, but this place, I am. I actually do steward and govern what happens in this house. Or if you were a teenager, this room. <laughs> this locker, this car, this whatever. You can make these the culture of the places where you actually have authority. Is this your own life?
the thing that I would be interested in us doing is to join Jesus in echoing God's blessing. Here's one of the things that I do firmly believe that God has given humans the authority to bless things. We get to speak well over one another and speak well over things in our life. I do believe that. But there is a uniqueness when we actually echo what God has already blessed. It's not something that we've come up with on our own, and, we're, and we can be sure that we're not blessing something and with our own kinds of motivations in it. When there are people in my life whom fall in these categories that Jesus blesses, I too can bless. I can be actively engaged in both speaking and seeking good for, full life and favor over. Matthew chapter 5 verses 3 through 12 is this idea that the kingdom of God looks radically different in a way that goes to where pain is and seeks to alleviate it and to be present with it. May that be our culture. May that be who we are. I want to pray for us, then we'll go. Father, you have blessed those who are poor and know their need for you. You have blessed those who mourn. You have blessed those who are humble. You have blessed those who are pure. You have blessed those who work for peace. You have blessed those who are, who are persecuted for being your followers. You bless those who hunger and thirst for your definition of justice. This is what you do. You bless them. And so, God, we do too. We speak well of those whom this world would seek to push to the side and say are unimportant or would want to avoid Give us grace, Holy Spirit, to be like you, not to pretend, not to virtue signal and to to take selfies of ourselves trying to do good stuff. Give us grace to truly live as you speak here. And the moment where we feel like we can talk ourselves out of it or the moment where we feel like we can justify not caring about what you have cared for, Holy Spirit, will you convict us to care as you care? Because you also speak through and move through those who this world is crushing to show parts of yourself. May we receive the joy of being in relationship and connection. And may we echo blessing what you bless, God. So, Father, I already know that this opens up a whole lot of different things in us. Holy Spirit, you are our great comforter. Where we need to be convicted, may we be convicted. But where these things touch a pain point for us, Holy Spirit, we trust you to comfort. We grieve together. We mourn together and trust you, great capital C comforter, to heal and restore and also to bring peace. In Jesus' name. Amen.